The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Previously on Pie Face. I wasn't always like this, you know. I used to work in a bakery, making pies, and I fell into a vat of radioactive pie filling left over from Chernobyl. My DNA fused with the pie filling, changing into PNA, making me half man, half pie. We did it. We stopped Pie Face. Oh, yeah! And I would have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for that meddling heck. And now... <gasps> Boss. Boss, wake up. What is it, you nincompoop? The guard accidentally dropped the keys. And they're just out of reach. Maybe Mom was right. Crime don't pay. Nonsense, you idiotic fool. After five and a half long years of starving Dr. Kitty Boots, I think he's finally thin enough to fit through these bars and get us out of this godforsaken heck hole. Yes. 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 Now you listen to me. You can talk? Of course I can talk, you non-litter-trained idiots. Far too long I have sat idly by, listening to the hairballed schemes of a half-pie man. Not anymore. Listen. Listen to me now. We're going to get out of this prison. We're going to avoid laser pointers of any kind, and we're once again going to attempt to mix human and pie DNA. Let's mosey, men. His pies may taste delicious, his cooking is divine. But girl, his heart is vicious, he'll make you eat key lime. He'll woo you with his baking to try and earn your trust. You must see through his faking, he'll turn the world to crust. High face, high face, wants more than just a slice. The toppings may look nice, his pies are cold as ice. High face, high face, has too much on his plate. His pies are filled with hate, he bakes a grisly face. With recipes for sin In chapter one he meets you In chapter two he wins Your heart if you will let him Fill your head with his lies That he might love a person Instead of just the pies I face, I face more than just his fill He'll throw you on the grill Your appetite he'll kill Pie face, pie face Wants more than just a bite Eats pies all through the night We'll never win this fight No stop
wings may look nice His pies are cold as ice My face, my face Has too much on his plate His pies are filled with hate He bakes a grisly face Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Gee, that sure was a riveting segment of Pie Face. Yeah, I wonder what will happen next. I guess we'll, we'll find out. Anyway, what, what, uh, what's our project this week? Well, Felix, as you know, this is the final project of the Ben Heck Show. It's going to be a two-parter. So I was thinking we should do something really cool. So years ago, when I first started doing electronics as an adult, I built an Atari 2600 portable based off the game console. How long ago was that? 18 years ago. So since then, I have obviously made lots of different portables and projects, mm -hmm. and I even made some Atari 800 XL computer projects along along the way. Right. This was my my first computer as a kid. I mean, not the one that I'm holding, but this that same model. Mo well, not the, even this model. Like the Atari 800 that series. series. Yes. Yeah. So you know, it's really dear to my heart. I still have my original computer at home. So I was thinking, you know, I've built laptops of that in the past. Mm -hmm. Usually taking a whole motherboard like this and then just making a laptop around it. Yeah. But what if we did something closer to that ZX Spectrum project, where we rip off all the chips and then we make our own circuit board to make it as small as possible. I like that idea. I really enjoy making circuit boards in house. So that's what we're gonna do, final project. It'll be a two-parter. We're going to make a handheld Atari 800 portable computer as small as possible. In the first episode, this episode, we're going to kind of reverse engineer the Atari 800, find the schematics online, copy all the schematics into a new design in Eagle, and then design a PCB around it and make a PCB. In the next episode, we're gonna stuff parts into that PCB, make sure everything works, fix anything that doesn't work, mm -hmm. and then design a cool enclosure around it, and I want it to look like this. The last time I made an Atari 800 computer, I made it look like the 70s. I want it to look like the 1984 version. So like beige, plastic, lots of uh, chamfers and air vents and uh, black keys. Yeah, so I want it to look like a handheld version of this with its own battery and screen. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Bat them hatches! Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Looks like I got something from eBay. I wonder if it's the Atari XE game system. As is untested. Hopefully it works. I mean, what could break in a system like this, right? Ha ha ha. I don't build them like they used to. Well, um, it comes with a lot of bubble wrap that I can reuse to pack something else. It's a circle of bubble wrap. Yum, 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 yum. We're the Disney Corporation. And we're gonna make Hamlet in Africa three times. Okay, I undid the screws. Let's see what's inside. Look at this beautiful pastel buttons. Looks like Miami Vice. Wow, it's got a huge shield. Let's see if we can pop this sucker out. Oh, look at that. Well, I'm gonna just squeeze all these Atari tabs over. So when we did that Atari 5200 project, it made me think of the Atari 800, which was my first computer. And I still have it as well. I also have like three of them. I have multiple of them, including my original, which I've fixed up over the years. Oh my gosh, this thing is dusty as heck. Hey, heck, that's my name. All right, so this thing has one more large logic chip versus the uh, 800XL. These things have gone up in price a lot. I remember you used to be able to get these things for like 35 bucks, now they're like 70 and I keep buying them and turning them into things. This is the Atari 800XL. This came out in 1984, and then this is the XE game system, which was yet again an Atari 800 rebranded as a game system. So the Atari 800 was a computer from 1979. They kind of turned it into a game system, the Atari 5200 in 1982, and then they yet again made it into a game system in 1987, at which point it was pretty obsolete, and they called it the XE game system. Although the rumor was, the only reason they made the XE game system was so they had 
a reason to like uh, sell their extra disk drives and peripherals. So this was allegedly a Trojan horse to sell peripherals, not because the system was actually that great. Although there are some things about it that are more convenient. Like if you look at um, right here, it uh, has 64K in uh, RAM and basically, well, it does it in two chips instead of eight. So that RAM was a little bit more modern. Also, a lot of the uh, glue logic here has been combined into the Freddy chip. So if you look at this one, it has one, two, three, four, five main uh, DIP40s. This one has six DIP40s. Also, the ROM is combined into a single unit. On the X800XL, there is a basic ROM and a operating system ROM. It's combined into a single ROM here. So, I mean, if you look at it, yeah, there's, well, yeah, okay, we have the big six, then we have uh, the RAM, then we have a few, uh, you know, glue logic things. Uh, 138, which is a uh, three to eight multiplexer. Then we have whatever that is, probably some sort of memory management chip. And then, oh, look, it's got a 555 timer in it. I bet you that is used for power on reset. So most of these systems, when you turn them on, they're in a weird state. So you actually, even if you don't press reset, they need to be reset. So what the 555 does is once the power turns on, it waits a certain amount of time and then it presses the reset button for you. So the system is nice and fresh when you start off. Uh, something else that's different, if you look right here on the 800XL, it's keyboard hooked up right here, the matrix, right? Then you have these two analog MUX chips, the uh, 4051BE chips right here. Now on the, uh, on the XE, those chips were in the detachable keyboard, the detachable keyboard attached right here. Uh, so we'll either need to order these chips in or since this, I didn't get the keyboard with it, this is all I got, probably one of the reasons it was somewhat affordable. Uh, we'll either need to build these chips in, well, we'll need to build these chips into our project. I can either steal them from this 800XL or just buy new ones. So I've built things with this in the past, but I always use the original motherboard. Now I've got the crazy idea to uh, hand wire it. It's my favorite old computer and it could be the last portable and it could also be the most insane hand wired project we've done. Hey, I've got this Atari 800XL power supply, which turns out is compatible with the XE game system. I've got this uh, screen that I'd like to use for my super small portable. Let's see if this thing works. It was listed as untested. Hey, it's a built-in game, Missile Command. Okay, um, I think if you hold down one of the buttons, it bypasses Missile Command and goes to basic. Oh, memory test. Ah, too long, didn't listen. Okay, so Missile Command is the built-in game because in 1987, Missile Command was the hot game. There you go, cool. All right, it boots up. That's pretty cool. Okay, I removed the ROM from the XCGS and then I burnt a ROM from the My IDE Atari Max forums. I also put a socket into the motherboard so I can easily test the ROM in this system before I do anything else. So the question is, will it work? It's been a long time since I've used this ROM. See if there's anything on the screen. My IDE 4.31, wait for IDE. Of course, it's not there, so it's going to be waiting forever. But it looks like the burning ROM worked. Sweet. Back when I first did this Atari project, I didn't have any ROMs laying around. I had to buy one. But now, after years of scrounging from circuit boards from arcade machines, I have more ROMs than I can ever use. Oh, how things have changed. A rat bash and stick. All right, well, next I'm gonna compare these chips with those in the Atari 800 XL. I also have a spare pokey laying around, which is the potentiometer and keyboard chip. I actually pulled that from a Atari 7800 ball blazer cartridge. So I, I'm gonna see if I can keep this motherboard as intact as possible. Maybe almost like copy it instead of like hacking it itself. All right, even though I had a few errors, which were entirely my fault, I socketed all of the five main chips. PIA, Peripheral Interface Adapter, which allows the joystick connections. GTIA, which creates a video signal. Antic, which does the alphanumeric characters and graphics. Potentiometer keyboard chip, which controls potentiometers and keyboards. Also the sound and the serial input output. And of course the CPU. Now, there's a couple other chips. There's a Freddy chip, and this is a basically a memory management RAM multiplexer chip. So you have our two RAM chips here, and these are four, each one is four bits by 64 kilobits. 
which means there's eight control lines going in there. There's eight address lines and then there's a row and column strobe. So first it does the eight bit row, then it flashes the eight bit column, and then it has a full 16 bit address. Then it gets half of the word RAM and also does the same thing over here. So basically this chip, from what I see, this was meant to allow for like high speed dual access. So like the video and the CPU could kind of share the RAM faster instead of slowly like they do now. Um, but I don't think it's used for anything really besides RAM multiplexing. So instead of having to have the refresh circuitry and the um, row column strobe caches and all that, that's basically combined here. So I actually found a functional diagram of this Freddy chip. It's basically just a bunch of gates uh, combined into one chip. So this just replaces, you know, several glue logic chips. So this would be a, a cheaper solution. And if you look at this compared to like the 800XL, there's you know, a third of the glue logic on it. So I guess the question is, you know, do I keep this and the crystal oscillator and the RAM, or do I replace all of this with more modern static RAM? I mean, honestly, it's probably more straightforward just to keep this chip because physically it's not that much bigger than two 32K RAM chips, and we already know it works. So speaking of that, I bought this at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. This is Space Harrier. A guy um, programmed this from scratch as a homebrew. He spent like five years doing this. It's an amazing conversion of Space Harrier on the Atari 800XL, so you need 64K for it to work. So I was thinking if I did do anything with the RAM, this game would use every bit of it, and if it works with this game, it would work. This game is like really, really well done. It uses uh, screen flickering to simulate more colors, so basically it alternates colors back and forth. But on a little screen like this, an actual NTSC, not an emulator, uh, you can't really see it. And of course there's music and, you know, like, get ready, but I don't have the audio hooked up. What are you doing here in the cave of monsters? Back in the 80s, someone would be given like six months to port this versus a homebrew who can spend like, you know, five years. That's the secret sauce but behind why homebrew games have better graphics. Uh, yeah, so I guess, you know, what I need to do now is think about how I'm going to make this smaller. I did find some schematics and I have been working in Eagle to create Eagle parts of all these chips so I can connect them in a diagram. So I was thinking this is more complex than other computers that I've hand wired before. However, if we do as much as possible with a PCB and like maybe make it with laser paint, we could you know, basically do as much as possible with like flat copper traces and then just hand wire what's left. Maybe if we could at least get the data and address buses done, then we could just hand wire the rest of the communication between the chips, which Aside from the data and address buses, mostly like enable lines and crystal oscillator lines and things like that. All right, here we are in Eagle. I've created Eagle parts of the main chips. What I did was I made a library and then I imported a DIP40, I think from the Z80 uh, library, and I assigned pins to it. So we have the GTIA, which runs the screen. We have the Antic, which creates the graphics and characters. We have the CPU, which is the CPU. Now the Atari used a custom CPU they made. It has a halt line that allows the graphics processors to easily halt the CPU if they need access to the RAM instead of it. Then we have the PIA, which we talked about. See how it has A0 through A7 and B0 through B7. Those are the joystick ports or other peripherals. The original Atari had four joystick ports, so up, down, left, right, times four, 16. There they are, right there. We also have the Pokey chip. Well, this has quite a few things. It has the audio of the system. It does the serial input output for the peripherals. And one thing cool about the old Atari, you can actually hook up like an FTDI cable to it, like one of these, and talk to it with a modern computer at 19200 baud. So that's pretty cool. It's basically directly compatible. The Pokey also does the keyboard, which we'll get to later. And then finally, we have the Freddy chip. If you look at it here, it has the entire uh, address bus hooked up to it, A0 all the way through A15. Then over here, it has RA0 through 7. That connects to the address lines on the two memory chips. So if you want to take a 16-bit address and turn it into an 8-bit address, basically it sends half of it and then the other half, and then the chip responds with the correct byte. So there's a bunch of clock signals up here. The Freddy chip also takes the main oscillator of 14 megahertz and divides it down to the system frequency of, I think it's 1.72 on the Atari. That's probably done with a delay line or a series of flip-flops or gates inside of it. Again, I mean, this does add a whole nother chip to the design, but it's probably more straightforward than trying to redo the memory itself. Again, we think about modern RAM and it just has, you know, it's all there in parallel, but uh, well, actually, no, that's not correct. They still use column and row in modern, in modern RAM to reduce the bus. 
Yeah, so these are the six main chips. I haven't added any support chips. I probably should add the RAM next if I'm gonna build this all in. Um, yeah, let's take a look at it in the graphics view. So this is what I have so far. As you can see, I've drawn the data bus, but now I need to get the address bus figured out. So as far as doing like a laser paint project, um, these traces might look kind of wide and you know gappy, but for laser paint, that's, you know, we don't wanna get too much closer than that otherwise, it's not that they don't laser correctly, it's that it's hard to scrub out the copper in the gaps. That's the real problem, not really the resolution of the laser. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm gonna do next, I'm going to uh, draw the RAM in as a part and probably the memory management unit and a couple other things. And then I will have a pretty good idea of how many chips I'll have on this board and then I can start doing more trace design. As you can see, the address lines have not been hooked up at all, but they're all there, so yeah. I'm thinking that this will be a double-sided laser paint board. That's more difficult to do, but Felix and I have an idea to increase our accuracy, so hopefully it will be usable. I'm gonna go in here and open up my library, open library, I have an Atari 800 library. So in the libraries, we have devices, which is, you know, like the thing, the package, Right now we just have a dip 40 and then the symbol, which in this case is the same as the items. I'm gonna go down to add package and I'm gonna import. I want a, a dip 18. Okay, so I'm gonna open that up and import it. So now I have a dip 18. So I'm gonna just make sure the pins are the way I want them. This should be number one, correct. This should be 18, correct. Okay, now I'm gonna go into symbol. So I'm gonna make a new one called RAM. So detailed. All right, so I have the RAM pin out right here. So this is what the RAM needs to be. So I'm going to do this. Now this is what it will appear like in your schematic. So I'm gonna go, go over here and grab a pin and I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right click, boom, boom, rotate it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Cool. I'm going to do my group select like that. Then go to move, right click, move group, just center that. Doesn't have to look super good. I'm not trying to impress anyone with this, although I guess I'm doing a web show. Draw a happy little box to represent our RAM. Cool, let's give it a super cool name. I'm gonna call it RAM. <laughs> I should actually have like more detail than that, but that's okay. This is just for me. All right, so I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna name these. So pin one is blah, 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 output enable. So if you can't draw a line over the label, you put a forward slash and that means active low. Cool, all right, I'm gonna go one by one, all the things from the pinout, label this RAM, and then I can drop it in the schematic. Okay, so here's the RAM. I have all the signals labeled on it, so this is the symbol. Now I need to go into device. I'm gonna create a new device, also called RAM. Yes, create the device. I'm gonna get a new window here. All right, so I need to add the symbol that is created, the RAM. Okay, so we need a symbol. Now we need a package, so we get on a new, add local package. It's gonna be our, uh, Dip 18, there it is. Now, here's the critical part, we need to connect it. So this is gonna connect the signals from our schematic to the pins on the package. And it doesn't always appear in the right order, so I have to go through one by one and make sure I've got it right. I usually let this auto increment from one and then select pin manually. So we've got output enable, next is D0, then D1, next is read write, connect A6, connect A5, connect a4, connect VCC, so VCC and VSS are in the opposite places you'd expect them to be on this RAM. But luckily it's not like the old school RAM where it had 12 volts, ugh. So this is, yeah, this is fairly modern, run it with five volts. A lot of times the old consoles, they would have a 12 volt supply and the only thing that it did was run the ancient RAM. Okay, I double checked my connections. I have all of the pins connected to all of the pads on the part, so the pins, of the schematic drawing are connected to the pads on the package drawing. So this is a schematic. A package is what the part actually looks like, where its pins are. And when you put them all together, you get a device. And now we have a device. So I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna go into my schematic. There's the Freddy chip. Freddy versus Jason versus Ash versus Freddy. How cool would that have been? Of course, Ash would have to win. He would say something like, hey, Freddy, must be hard to pick your nose with those hands, huh? You will die. Come get some. All right, here's our RAM. Oh yeah. So let's connect this RAM to the Freddy chip. Now here's the bigger question. How much space do these RAM chips take up? Well, that's not 
too bad. I can put them right below the Freddy chip, just like that. Oh yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we can totally make this work. See, part of the reason I came up with this idea was when we took apart that Atari 5200 and I saw how small and close together the chips were and I'm like, why is this motherboard so big? That got me thinking, why is this motherboard so big? And here we are. All right, let's do another update here. So here's the ROM, the OS ROM. Here's the GTIA. I have most everything attached to that. This is the television adapter, although it also looks at the player's triggers and whatnot. Then down here, this will be the uh, analog video circuitry. There'll be a resistor ladder after the series of buffers that will combine the four luminance signals, which gives you 16 levels of brightness with the color signal and sync, which will give us a composite video signal. Um, antics mostly hooked up. There's a few phase things I haven't hooked up all the way here. Uh, CPU, I believe, is entirely connected. Oh, I still need to add the crystal oscillator. <laughs> PIA, PIA, I believe, is completely connected. I've definitely learned some things about the architecture here, how they are using extra lines as memory management. Those lines that were used up by joystick ports in the old Atari 800, well, here, they're being used for memory management. Pretty cool. Here's the Pokey potentiometer keyboard. Have the uh, keyboard inputs and outputs here. I've been looking over how the keyboard works and it looks like it's a, it's an eight by eight scan, but it actually only reads it one bit at a time, which is uh, pretty crazy. But again, the, this Pokey chip is doing that automatically. So it probably just sees if a key has been pressed and then triggers an interrupt on its interrupt line, which is someplace here. Oh, there it is, IRQ. If I had to guess, yeah, Pokey probably scans the keyboard. If, it's, if there's a change, yeah, it notifies the processor. That's just my guess, but that's probably what happens. So the Freddy chip, um, this has the uh, clock in coming from it. So that's going to be our 17 point, whatever it is, megahertz oscillator. That's gonna be divided into the actual pixel clock and CPU clock. So you see we have the oscillator and O2 here as output. And uh, Freddy's also doing the memory management. So I guess we do need this chip for a few other things. Then we have our isolation resistors and our RAM. We'll just be using the original RAM chips. And down here, this is the, um, this is a uh, analog MUX. <laughs> it's kind of weird how it works. So A, B, and C are used to set a three bit value, which would be zero to seven. So these MUXs are basically uh, scanning up and down, like selecting one of eight rows and then either putting a high or a low into it and then reading the result back. So I think, yeah, it's basically scanning the keyboard like eight by eight. And then if it sees a, you know, if it sees a bit set or not, then it knows, hey, that key has been pressed. Yeah, so I have most of that all set up. Uh, see how I have uh, key 13, 12, blah, blah, blah. That refers to the matrix numbers, right? So I labeled those separately on the screen because I wanna have a disconnect. So basically the keyboard will be something that you can, uh, you can remove from this. And I also noticed that since the XEGS had a removable keyboard, one of these lines was a form of uh, keyboard detect. So I'll just, I just tired that high, so the keyboard's always active. Although I still have to figure out how to fit the joystick and a control into it. Because the ZX Spectrum, it used the keyboard as the controller, but the Atari used joystick. So how do I get them both in the air of your thumbs? I haven't figured that out yet. Okay, then over here, uh, yeah, this is, again, is just our memory management unit. This, I think, is pretty much all set up. Yeah, so I just have to make sure I have everything connected on the bus. I'm gonna get all the digital stuff figured out, and then I'll add the audio and video analog circuitry. But even after I get all the schematic done, I have to go in and uh, trace everything, basically make everything work. So I'm gonna try to do this as laser paint, although, man, this is, this would be a bit of a, a push for a professionally made board. Look at this mess. I mean, I have the data lines routed, but I'll probably end up ripping those up. Yeah, but I don't think we have time for Osh Park because the show is ending. So whatever board I design has to be something we can make in-house with laser paint. Okay, here is the keyboard section of the Atari 800 XEGS. We have all the keys. We have the analog multiplexers up here. We also have our joystick controls. And I want to start with this um, because it's, well, for one thing, it's been designed, it's done. Unlike the main board, which I'm still working on. So what I've done is I've brought it into Photoshop and Illustrator. So Felix and I were doing some tests about laser paint and we've only done double-sided laser paint a couple times and usually doesn't work. And the problem we've had in the past is that we've always squared it up to the corner of a PCB. So we'll take a PCB and we'll put it into a jig like this and then we'll flip it, but we'll flip it relative the edges. And that re relies on the edges being perfectly straight and even. So I was thinking it might be better if we used uh, like a peg uh, system. 
right? So what this represents, this represents a six by six piece of copper clad, which will be double-sided laser paint copper clad. And then we'll take that on the big CNC machine and we'll drill four holes. We won't actually cut the, the, uh, the edges. We can just run those through a bandsaw because my thought is all that really matters is the reference between those four holes and what you're trying to, uh, to laser paint. Then what we'll do is we'll um, go on the laser and put in a piece of like six millimeter plywood or something and we'll laser cut these four holes and that will be our jig. I also 3D printed this. This is a, a jig post. So we take our PCB and we put it down into the wooden jig and then we put four of these down to hold it to the four uh, holes. So instead of having to worry about how straight the edges are, because even on the CNC machine, they might not be perfectly straight or there might be some chatter or something, but that won't matter. So see, this is the um, this is a six by 3.7 inch. See how it's not gonna go even to the edges of the laser? What we'll do is we'll basically just flip it. We'll take the board out and we'll flip it upside down and then put it back down. And then so th see, the edges won't matter. The only thing that will matter are these four holes. And as long as our art is centered within those four holes, that should give us a good flip. So in this case, uh, we'll take the four holes here like this, make sure we don't get anything else, uh, like for the bottom layer. Now see right now the bottom layer is being displayed as it would be behind it, but of course we have to flip it. So we'll just do a horizontal uh, flip in Illustrator and since everything is within the holes, it's still in the same position. See how the holes didn't move? And that should give us the most accurate possible flip for our laser paint project. All right, let's see if this works. Wow, that double-sided PCB turned out great. Yeah, I'm glad it gave us the accuracy we needed to get that double-sided to work. Yeah, that peg idea was great, Felix. Way to go. Thanks. All right, so we've got this project about half done. In the next episode, the final episode of the show, we're gonna take that PCB and stuff it with parts and then see if it works as an 8-bit computer. And if it does work, which, uh, why wouldn't it? We'll build a cool enclosure around it that looks like this. So. What were your favorite 8-bit computers from the 1980s? Have you ever made a PCB before? If you have any comments, leave them to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash TBHS. Where you can also go to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. Hey, we should see what PyFace is up to. Oh wow, I'm really excited to see how that turns out. What is this place? It's my lair, the Kitty Cave. While you runts of the litter have been rotting away in a jail cell, I, under cover of darkness, have been sneaking away to create this. A microwave? No, fool. It's the Humanopytic 3000. What'd it do? Why don't you stick your head in there, Krusty? <laughs> okay. Is this a hairdryer or something? <laughs> Just hold it in there a little longer. <laughs> it's incredible, Dr. Kitty Boots. You've achieved complete pyrosynthesis with nothing but a cat box full of scraps in somebody's basement. Yes, and this is just the beginning. I will... What's happening, Dr. Kitty Boots? I don't know. I... What is this? It's just a spike. It will soon stabilize. I hungry. Oh, no, no, no. Dear God! I hate to admit it, but only one man can defeat this monstrosity. My arch nemesis, Bondendorf. Listen, I don't want to send any more money to any Nigerian princes. Piefish, why are you calling me? <gasps> Complete pyrosynthesis, you say? All right, I think I can help. 
but I need to make a call. Complete biosynthesis, you say? Well, dip my crumpets in pastry filling. We're going to need hella backup. Hmm. You are trying to catch a man with a pie for a head? He put pie on his head? No, 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 it's a living pie man. Oh, living pie man. Count me in. Who thinks, oh, we need another King Arthur movie? Call Sean Austin. Listen, do you guys know BASIC? If there's one thing all government facilities do is they use BASIC. The thing that's dumb is they would have been using Unix back then, but it's Unix is not nostalgic. <laughs>